the tribunal, please. The honors will uh, notice that we've substituted an enlarged chart for the photostatic copy that was introduced in evidence this morning. Another thing I'd like to call your honor's attention to is the fact that the other chart, the big one, was dated in 1945, and therefore did not show the defendant Hess because of his flight to England in 1941, and it will be recalled that the defendant Hess occupied the position before Borman directly under the Fuhrer in the party organization. We now take up the Hoheitz Strager. The Hoheitz Strager, diverting from the text, is shown on this chart very well, and all of those shown in black, and the black blocks constitute the Hoheitz Strager beginning with the Führer and going down the vertical <coughs> column, clear down to the block light. Within the leadership core of the Nazi party, certain of the political leaders possessed a higher degree of responsibility than others, were vested with special prerogatives and constituted a distinctive and elite group within the party hierarchy. These were the so-called Hoheitz Trager, or bearers of sovereignty, who represented the party within the area of jurisdiction, the so-called Hoheitsgebiet, which is a sector, as I understand, of sovereignty. I now quote from page nine of the English translation of document 1893, P.S. Page nine of the English translation. I quote, among the political leaders, the Hoheit Streger assumed a special position. Contrary to the other political leaders who have departmental missions, the Hoheit Streger themselves are in charge of the geographical sector known as the Hoheit's Gebiet, sectors of sovereignty. The Hoheit Streger are the Fuhrer, the Gauleiter, the Kreisleiter, the Ortsgruppenleiter, the Zellenleiter, and the block light. The Hoheit's Gebiet are the Reich, the Gau, the Kreis, the Ortsgruppe, the Zelle, and the Block. Within their sector of sovereignty, the Hoheit's Trigger have sovereign political rights. They represent the party within their sector. The Hoheit's Trigger supervise all party officers within their jurisdiction and are responsible for the maintenance of discipline. Your Honor, please, that is page number nine of the English translations you find yeah. of 1893. Yeah. The Hoheit Streger supervise all party officers within their jurisdiction and are responsible for the maintenance of discipline the directors of offices and so forth and of the affiliated organizations are responsible to their respective Hoheit Streger as regards their special missions. The Hoheit Streger are superior to all political leaders, managers and so forth within their sector. As regards personal consideration, Hoheit Streger are endowed with special rights. The Hoheit Strager of the party are not to be administrative officials, but are to move in a continuous vital contact with the political leaders of the population within their sector. The Hoheit Strager are responsible for the proper and good supervision of all members of the nation within their sector. The party intends to achieve a state of affairs in which the individual German will find his way to the party. Unquote. The distinctive character of the Politischer Leiter constituting the Hoheit Streger and their existence and operation and uh, as an indefiable group are indicated by the publication of a magazine 
entitled Der Hoheit Strager, whose distribution was limited by regulation of the Reich organization leader to the Hoheit Strager and certain other designated politischer Leiter. I now refer to document 2660 PS, which I offer in evidence, and I'd like to digress from the published manuscript and call it number 2660 PS. Uh, U.S. Exhibit number 325. I'd like to exhibit this book to your honors. This is the book itself, and it's for the Hoheit Streger with a very limited uh, distribution. And I quote from the inside cover of this magazine, which reads as follows. It's right in the beginning. Der Hoheit Streger, the contents of which is to be handled confidentially, serves only for the orientation of the competent leaders. It may not be loaned out to other persons. Then follows a list of the Hoheit Streger and other political leaders authorized to receive the magazine. The magazine states in addition that the following were entitled to receive it. And I'd like to emphasize the ones to receive it. Commandants, unit commanders, and candidates of order castles, the Reich, shock troop, and Gau speakers of the NSDAP, the lieutenant generals and major generals of the SA, the SS, the NSFK, which is the Flieger Corps, Flying Corps, and the NSKK, the Party Motor Corps. Lieutenant generals and major generals of the HJ, that's the Hitler Jugend. The fact that this magazine existed, that it derived its name from the commanding officers of the leadership corps, that it was distributed to the elite of the leadership corps. In other words, that a house bulletin was circulated down the command channels of the leadership corps <coughs> is probative of the fact that the leadership corps of the Nazi party was a group or an organization within the meaning of Article 9 of the Charter. An examination of the contents of the magazine, Der Hoheit Streger, reveals a continuing concern by the leadership corps of the Nazi party in measures and doctrines which were employed throughout the course of the conspiracy charged in the indictment. I shall not uh, trouble the tribunal nor encumber the record by offering in evidence exhaustive enumeration of these matters, but it may serve to clarify the plans and policies of the inner elite of the leadership corps by indicating that a random sampling of articles published and policies advocated in the various issues of the magazine from February 1937 to October 1938 included the following slanderous anti-Semitic articles, attacks on Catholicism and the Christian religion and clergy, the need for motorized armament, the urgent need for expanded Lebensraum and colonies, resistant attacks on the League of Nations, the use of the block and cell in achieving favorable party votes, the intimate association between the Wehrmacht and the political leadership, the racial doctrines of fascism, the cult of leadership, the role of the Gau, the Ortsgruppen, and Zellen in the expansion of Germany, and related matters, all of which constituted elements and doctrinal techniques in the carrying out of the conspiracy charged in the indictment. Political leaders were organized according to the leadership principle. I quote from the fourth paragraph of page two of document 1893 fourth paragraph of page two, document 1893. It's at the bottom of the page and top of page three. The basis of the party organization is the Fuhrer thought. The public is unable 
to rule itself either directly or indirectly. All political leaders stand as appointed by the Fuhrer and are responsible to him. They possess full authority toward the lower echelons. Only a man who has absorbed the school of subordinate functions within the party has a claim to the higher Fuhrer offices. We can only use Fuhrers who have served from the ground up. Any political leader who does not conform to these principles is to be dismissed or to be sent back to the lower offices as Blockleiter, Zellenleiter for further training. The political leader is not an office worker, but the political deputy of the Fuhrer. Within the political leadership, we're building the political leadership of the state. The type of the political leader is not characterized by the office which he represents. There's no such thing as a political leader of the NSBO, etc. But there's only the political leader of the NSDAP. Each political leader was sworn in yearly. I've ended the quotation. According to the party manual, the wording of the oath was as follows, and I quote from the second paragraph of page three of document 1893. Quote, I pledge eternal allegiance to Adolf Hitler. I pledge unconditional obedience to him and the Führers appointed by him, unquote. The organization book of the NSDAP also provides, and I quote from page three, paragraph four of the same document, quote, the political leader is inseparably tied to the ideology and the organization of the NSDAP. His oath only ends with his death or with his expulsion from the National Socialist Community, unquote. Appointment of political leaders. With respect to the appointment of the political leaders constituting the leadership core of the party, the organization book, which is document 1893, and I quote from page four as follows. Quote, the Fuhrer appointed the following political leaders. All Reichsleiter and all political leaders within the Reichsleitung, the party directorate, including the women's leaders. All Gauleiter, including the political leaders holding offices in the Gauleitung, the Gau party directorate, including Gau women's leaders, and all Kreisleiter. The Gauleiter appointed, A, the political leaders and women's leaders within the Gau party directorate. B, the political leaders and directors of women's leagues and the Christ Party Directory. C, all arts group and lighter. The Christ Leiter appoints the political leaders and the directors of the women's league of the arts group, including the block and cell leaders, unquote. The power of the Hoheitz trigger to call upon other party formations. The Hoheitsträger among the leadership corps were entitled to call upon and utilize the various party formations as necessary for the execution of the Nazi party policies. The party manual provides, with respect to the power and authority of the Hoheitsträger, to requisition the services of the SA, and I quote from page 11 of this same document, 1893, the Hoheitsträger is responsible for the entire political appearance of the movement within his zone. The SA leader of that zone is tied to the directives of the Hoheitsträger in that respect. The Hoheitsträger is the ranking representative of the party to include all organizations within his zone. He may requisition the SA located within his zone from the respective SA leader if they are needed for the execution of a political mission. The Hoheitsträger will then assign the mission to the SA. Should the Hoheitsträger need more SA for the execution of the political mission than is locally available, 
he then applies to the next higher office of sovereignty, which in turn, Your Honor, please, at page 11, if you're... He next applies to the next higher office of the sovereignty, which in turn requests the S.A. from the S.A. office in his sector. End of quotation. According to the party manual, the Hohite Straker had the same authority to call upon the services of the SS and NSKK as they possessed with respect to the SA. With respect to the authority of the Hohite Straker to call upon the services of the Hitler Youth, the HJ, the party manual follows, and I quote from page 11, last paragraph of that translation, I quote, the political leader has the right to requisition the H.J., that's a Hitler Jugend, in the same manner as the S.A. for the execution of a political action. In appointing leaders of the H.J. and the H.J., the office of the H.J. must procure the approval of the Hohite Strager of his zone. This means that the Hohite Strager can prevent the appointment of leaders unsuited for leadership of youth. If his approval has not been procured, an appointment may be canceled if he so requests, end of quotation. An example of the use of the party formations at the call of the leadership corps of the party is provided by the action taken by the Reichsleiter for party organization of the National Socialist Party, Dr. Robert Ly, leading to the deliberate dissolution of the free trade unions on 2nd of May, 1933. I quote from document 392, uh, U.S. Exhibit 326, which is a copy of the directive issued by the defendant Lai on 21 April 1933, reproduces, reproduced on pages 51 and 2 of The Social Life in Germany by Professor Muller. In this directive, the late defendant Lai directed the employment of the SA and SS in the occupation of trade unions and for taking trade union leaders into protective custody. I now quote from paragraph six of page one of document 392 PS. It's the third and fourth paragraph from the bottom of the page. Quote, SA as well as SS. Did you want to find it? Document 392, page 1. It's about the third or fourth paragraph from the bottom of the page. Quoting, S.A. as well as S.S. are to be employed for the occupation of trade union properties and for the taking of personalities who come into question into protective custody. The Galliter is to proceed with his measures on a basis of the closest understanding with competent regional sales director. End of quotation. I also quote from the second paragraph of page two of that same document, page two of that same document, which reads, quoting, the following are to be taken into protective custody all trade union chairmen, the district secretaries, and the branch directors of the Bank for Workers, Employees, and Officials Incorporated, included, unquote. End of quotation. I now offer in evidence document 2474 PS, U.S. Exhibit 327, which is a copy of a decree issued by the defendant Hess as deputy of the Fuhrer dated 25 October 1934, which underwrites the authority of the Hohite Strager with respect to party formations. I quote from the numbered paragraphs, document 2474 PS, 1, 5, and 6 of page 1, 2474. Number 2474. 
page one of the English translation. <clears throat> From paragraphs one, five, and six, quoting, the political leadership within the party and its political representation toward all offices, state or others, which are outside of the party, lie solely and exclusively with the Hoheitsträger, bearers of sovereignty, which is to say with me, the Gauleiter, the Kreisleiter, and the Ortsgruppenleiter. The departmental workers of the party organizations, as well as the Reichsleiter, office directors, etc., as well as the leaders of the SA, SS, HJ, and the subordinate affiliations may not enter into binding agreements of a political nature with state and other offices except when so authorized by their Hoheitsträger. In places where the territories of the units of the SA, the SS, and HJ, and the subordinate affiliations do not coincide with the zones of the Hoheitsträger, the Hoheitsträger will give his political directives to the ranking leader of each unit within the zone of sovereignty, unquote. It was the official policy of the leadership corps to establish close and cooperative relations with the Gestapo. The tribunal will, re head, will recall that the head of the German police and SS, Himmler, was a Reichsleiter on the top level of the leadership corps. Without offering in evidence a decree issued by the defendant Bormann as chief of staff of the deputy of the Fuhrer, dated 26 June 1935, I asked the court to take judicial knowledge and I quote, in order to effect a closer contact between the officers of the party and its organizations with the directors of the secret state police, Gestapo. The deputy of the Fuhrer requests that the directors of the Gestapo be invited to attend all the larger official rallies of the party and its organization." Unquote. That's from uh, 1937 edition, page 143, dated 26 June 1937, the decrees of the deputy of the Fuhrer. With reference to the meeting and conferences among the Hoheitsträger of the leadership corps, it is the contention of the prosecution that the members of the leadership corps constituted a, distinct, a distinctive and identifiable group or organization is strongly supported by the fact that the various Hoheitsträger were under an absolute obligation to meet and confer periodically, not only with the, ref with the staff officers on their own staffs, but with the political leaders and staff officers immediately subordinate to them. For example, the Gauleiter was bound to confer with his staff officers, such as his deputy, so forth, uh, which included uh, the school leaders, the propaganda leader, the press leader, and his Gal party judge, so on, every eight to 14 days. Furthermore, the Gauleiter was obligated to meet with the various Gauleiter subordinate to him once every three months for a three-day convention for the purpose of discussing and clarifying Nazi party policies and directives, for hearing basic lectures on party policy, and for the mutual exchange of information pertinent to the party's current program. The Gauleiter was also obligated to meet at least once a month with the leaders of the party formations and affiliated organizations within his Gau area, such as the leaders of the SA, the SS, the Hitler Youth, and others. In support of these statements, I quote from page 8 of document 1893. page 8 of document 1893. I don't think it's necessary to read all of that. Quote, leader conferences in the district, a district leader, page number 8 of 1893. 
Your Honor, please, with your permission, I'll omit the reading of that because it is really summarized in my previous statement. I'll quote paragraph D, subparagraph D. The Barrow of Sovereignty will meet at least once a month with the leaders of the SA, SS, NSKK, HJ, as well as the RAD and the NSFK who are within the zone for the purpose of mutual orientation, unquote. The organization book of the party imposes a similar requirement of regular and periodical conferences and meetings upon all the other Hohite Strager, including the Kreisleiter, Ortsgruppenleiter, Zellenleiter, and Blockleiter. The clear consequence of such regular and obligatory conferences and meetings by all the Hohite Strager, both with their own staff and with political leaders and staff officers subordinate was that basic Nazi policies and directives issued by Hitler and the leader of the party chancellery, the defendant Bormann, directly through the chain of command of the Hoheitsträger, and functional policies issued by the various Reichsleiter and Reich office holders down functional and technical channels were certain to be notified to, received and understood by the bulk of the membership of the leadership corps. If I may digress from my text, call attention of this chart, you'll see the dotted lines connecting down uh, from the party level, the gal level, to similar offices in the lower level. Now I next come to the statistics relating to the leadership core of the Nazi party. The evidence relating to the size of the leadership core of the Nazi party, and as previously shown, the leadership core comprised the sum of officials of the Nazi party, including in addition to Hitler and the members of the Reichsleitung, such as the Reichsleiter and the Reich office holders, a hierarchy of Hoet Strager, which I have described, as well as staff officers attached to the Hoet Strager. I now offer in evidence document 2958 PS, USA Exhibit 325. And this is issue number 8, 1939, of the official leadership core organ, Der Hoheit Strager, similar to the one I exhibited a moment ago. And this is for the year 1939. This shows that there were 40 gal and one foreign gal, each led by gal Leiter. That's 41. 808 Christ Leiter. Uh, you said 40 gals? For, uh, 41. Oh, uh, what's the number of the document you're dealing with? 2958, sir. 2958, thank you. Uh, if Your Honor, please, it... <coughs> well, it's on, it's uh, just one page document, 2958. Yes, I see. <coughs> I believe in that translation it starts at the bottom. Yes. 28,376 Ortsgruppenleiter, 89,378 Zellenleiter, and 463,048 Blockleiter. However, as shown by the evidence previously introduced, the leadership core of the Nazi party was composed not only of the Hoheitsträger, but also of the staff officers or office holders attached to the Hoheitsträger. The Gauleiter, for example, was assisted by a deputy Gauleiter, several Gau inspectors, and a staff which was divided into main offices, the Hauptamter and Amter including such departments as the Gau Staff Office, the Treasurer, the Education Office, Propaganda Office, Press Office, University Teachers, Communal Policy, and so forth. 
As previously shown, the staff office structure of the GAL was substantially represented in the lower levels of the leadership core organization, such as the Kreis, the Ortsgruppen, and so on. The Kreis and the smaller territorial areas of the party were also organized into staff offices dealing with the various activities of the leadership corps. But of course, the importance and number of such staff officers diminished as the unit dropped in the hierarchy, so that while the Chrysler staff contained all or most of the departments mentioned for the GAL, the Arts Group had fewer departments and lower ones fewer still. Firm figures have not been found as to the total number of staff officers as distinguished from the Hoheitsträger, our political commanders themselves included within the leadership corps. With respect to the scope and composition of the leadership corps of the Nazi party, the prosecution adopts the view and respectfully submits to this tribunal that in defining the limits of the leadership corps, staff officers should only be included down to and including the Christ. Upon this basis, the leadership core of the Nazi party did constitute the Führer, the members of the Reichsleitung, the five levels of the Hoheitsträger, and the staff officers attached to the 40-odd Gauleiter and the eight or 900 Kreisleiter. Adopting this definition of the leadership core, it will be seen that the total figure for the membership of that organization based upon the statistics cited from the basic handbook for Germany, amounts to around 600,000. And by accepting the staff officers of the lower levels, as may be provided, as is provided in the indictment, and as just defined, and without prejudice to any later individual action against those accepted, we think the figure of around 600,000 is approximately correct. It is true that this figure is based upon an admittedly limited view of the size of the membership of the leadership corps of the Nazi party. For the evidence has shown that the leadership corps in effect <coughs> embraced staff officers attached to the subordinate Hoheit Strager. And the inclusion of such staff officers in the estimation of the size of the leadership corps, if we had so recommended, would have been considerably enlarged so that the final figure, if you had included staff officers to the block lighter, would have been two million in round numbers. What is the reason for excluding them? Sir? What reason is that for excluding them? For including them? Excluding them. Excluding them. For this reason, uh, Your Honor, down in the block lighter, he might have called on a, an individual laborer that it might have been on his staff, but he certainly didn't have the discretion <coughs> that a staff leader did, for example, on the gal lighter, say as a propaganda man who disseminated information down as well as helped participate in plans and policy of the upper organization. The subordinate staff officers thus excluded were responsible functionally to the higher staff officers with respect to their particular specialty, such as propaganda, party organization, and so on, and to their respective Hoheitsträger with respect to discipline and policy control. And as I mentioned, likewise, the higher staff officers participated in policy and planning and passed those policies on down technical levels or technical channels as opposed to command channels. The leadership corps of the Nazi party joined and participated in the common plan of conspiracy is the next <coughs> title. The program of the party proclaimed by Hitler on 24 February 1920 contained the chief elements of the Nazi plan for domination and conquest. I now quote from document 1708 PS, which is the yearbook for 1941, published by the party and edited by the late Robert Lye. 
And this book contains the famous 25 points of the party, which I now offer in evidence as USA exhibit number 324. Diverting from the text, I don't intend to quote these 25 party objectives, but only refer to a few of them. Page one of the English translation, I quote, document 1708 PS. Quote, we demand the unification of all Germans in greater Germany on the basis of the right of self-determination of peoples, unquote. Point two of that program demanded unilateral abolition of the peace treaties of Versailles and Saint Germain, which I quote, quote, we demand equality of rights for the German people in respect to the other nations. Abrogation of the peace treaties of Versailles and Saint Germain, unquote. Point three, quoting, we demand land and territory, colonies, for the substance of our people and colonization for over surplus population, unquote. Point four, quote, only a member of the race can be a citizen. A member of the race can only be one who is of German blood without consideration of confession. Consequently, no Jew can be a member of the race, unquote. Point six, we demand that every public office of any sort whatsoever, whether in the Reich, the county, or municipality, be filled only by citizens. We combat the corrupting parliamentary economy, office holding only according to party inclinations, without consideration of character or abilities." Unquote. Point 22. This is from page two of the English translation, 1708, quote, we demand the abolition of the mercenary troops and the formation of a national army, unquote. Now back to page one, another quotation. Quote, the program is the political foundation of the NSDAP and accordingly the primary political law of the state. All legal precepts are to be applied in the spirit of the party program. Since the taking over of control, the Fuhrer has succeeded in the realization of the essential portions of the party program from the fundamentals to the details. The party program of the NSDAP was proclaimed on 24 February 1920 by Adolf Hitler at the first large party gathering in Munich and since that day has remained unaltered. The National Socialist philosophy is summarized in 25 points, unquote. As previously mentioned, the party program was binding upon the political leaders and they were under duty to, to support and to carry out the program. <laughs> the party manual states, and I quote again from the middle of page one of document 1893, page one, 1893, quote, the commandments of the National Socialists. The Fuhrer is always right. The program be your dogma. It demands your utter devotion to the movement. Right is what serves the movement, and thus Germany. Page one, document 1893. Sorry, Your And on page two of the same document, Another brief quotation. The leadership corps is responsible for the complete penetration of the German nation with the national socialist spirit, unquote. The oath of the political leader to Hitler has been previously mentioned. In this connection, the party manual provides, 
And I quote from the second paragraph on page three of the same document. Quote, the political leader is inseparably tied to the ideology and organization of the NSDAP. His oath only ends with his death or with his expulsion from the National Socialist Community. <coughs> While the leadership principle assured the binding nature of Hitler's statements, program, and policies upon the entire party and leadership core thereof, the leadership principle also established the full responsibility of the individual political leader within the province and jurisdiction of his office or position. The leadership principle applied not only to Hitler as the supreme leader, but also to the political leaders under him, and thus permeated the entire leadership corps. I quote from the middle of page two of document 1893. Page two of 1893, quote, the basis of the party organization is the Führer thought. All political leaders stand as appointed by the Führer and responsible to him. They possess full authority toward the lower echelons." Unquote. The various Hoheitsträger of the leadership corps were in their respective areas themselves Führer. I quote from the third paragraph of page nine of this same document. Page nine. <coughs> Within their sector of sovereignty, the Hoheitsträger, uh, naming them, have sovereign political rights. They are responsible for the entire political situation within their sector, unquote. I again refer to a quote from document 1814 PS, U.S. Exhibit 328, which is the party book, document 1814 PS. Just a one sentence quotation. In which it is stated, quote, the party is an order of Fuhrer. Unquote. The subjugation of the entire membership of the leadership corps to the fiat of the Fuhrer Prinzip is clearly shown in the following passage from the party manual, and it's this same document on page three. Quote, a solid <coughs> anchorage for all the organizations within the party structure <coughs> is provided. <coughs> and a firm connection within, with the sovereign leaders of the NSDAP is created in accordance with the Fuhrer principle." Unquote. Next is the subject the Nazi party directed by the leadership corps dominated and controlled the German state and government. The trial brief dealing with the criminality of the Reich cabinet sets forth the evidence as to the identity of various ministers comprising the cabinet, and I shall not deal with that subject. The presence of the Reichsleiter and other prominent members of the leadership corps in the cabinet facilitated the domination of the cabinet by the Nazi party and the leadership corps. And I'll omit the next paragraph down to the law of July 14, 1933. A law of 14 July 1933 outlaw and forbade the formation of any political parties other than the Nazi party and made offenses against this a punishable crime, thereby establishing the one-party state and rendering the leadership corps immune from the opposition of organized political groups. I now quote from document 1388 P.S. Uh, that being the English translation of the law against the formation of new political parties. <coughs> Stated in 14 July 1933, Reich's Gazette Blatt 1933, Part 1, page 479. 
And I quote the first two <coughs> articles of this law, which read as follows, quote, the National Socialist German Workers' Party constitutes the only political party in Germany. Whoever undertakes to maintain the organizational structure of another political party or to form a new political party will be punished with penal <coughs> servitude up to three years or with imprisonment of from six months to three years if the deed is not subject to a greater penalty according to other regulations, unquote. I'll skip the next paragraph. I also quote, I now quote from document 1398, just following that, which is the English translation of the law to supplement the law for the restoration of professional civil service. Dated 20 July 1933, 1933 writes Gazette Blatt, part one, page 518. On October 13, 1933, quote, a law to guarantee public peace, unquote, was enacted which provided in the alia that the death penalty or other severe punishment should be imposed upon any person who, quote, undertakes to kill a member of the SA or the SS a trustee or agent of the NSDAP out of political motives or on account of their official activity, unquote. Where was that you were reading? 1398, P.S.? Yes, sir, 1398. Was it 1398? Yes. I'm an error, sir. It's 1394, according to the direction. 1394. <coughs> Just previous. Which which uh, article were you reading? Sorry. Which article were you reading? Your Honor, please, I don't have the reference, but here's the quotation. I think it's on that one page. A law to guarantee public peace, and then it has to do, it's Article 2, I believe, or Paragraph 2. Paragraph 2, Article 1. I next refer to Document 1395, P.S. Article, uh, document 1395 is the English translation of the law on security and the unity of the party and state of 1 December 1933. And it was enacted to secure the unity of the party and state. This law provided that the Nazi party was the pillar of the German state and was linked to it indissolubly. It also made the deputy of the Fuhrer then Hess and the chief of staff of the SA then rung members of the Reich cabinet. And I quote, after the victory of the National Socialist Revolution, the National Socialistic German Labor Party is the bearer of the concept of the German <coughs> state and is inseparably the state. It will be a part of the public law its organization will be determined by the Fuhrer. The deputy of the Fuhrer and the chief of staff of the SA will become members of the Reich government in order to ensure close cooperation of the offices of the party and SA with the public authorities in the quotation. This law was a basic measure in enthroning the leadership corps in a position of supreme political power in Germany. For it laid it down that the party directed by the leadership corps was the embodiment of the state, and in fact was the state. Moreover, this law made both the Fuhrer's deputy and the chief of staff of the SA, which was the party formation subject to the call 
of the Hoheitsträger, cabinet members, thus further solidifying the leadership control of the cabinet. The dominant position of the leadership corps is further revealed by the provision that the Reich Chancellor would issue the carrying out regulations of this law in his capacity as Führer of the Nazi party. The fact that Hitler, as Führer of the leadership corps, could promulgate rules which would have statutory force and be published in the Reich's Gazette Blatt, the proper compilation for state enactments, is but a further reflection of the reality of the party's domination of the German state. I now refer to document 2775 PS, which is number 330, USA exhibit number 330, which is the English translation of certain extracts from Hitler's speeches to the 1934 and 1935 Party Congress at Nuremberg. I quote from the second extract in document 2775, which is a declaration by Hitler to the 1935 Party Congress and which reads just one sentence. It is not the state which gives orders to us. It is we who give orders to the state, unquote. Upon the evidence of that categorical statement of the Fuhrer of the Leadership Corps, affirming the dominance of the party over the state cannot be reputed. On the 30th of June, 1934, Hitler, as head of the Nazi party, directed the massacre of hundreds of SA men and other political opponents. Hitler sought to justify these mass murders by declaring to the Reichstag that, quote, at that hour I was responsible for the fate of the German nation and the supreme judge of the German people, unquote. The evidence relating to these current events uh, to these events will be presented at a later stage in connection with the case against the SA. On the 3rd of July, 1934, the cabinet issued a decree describing the murders and the massacre of 30th June, 1934, in effect as legitimate self-defense by the state. By this law, the Reich cabinet moved to make themselves accessories after the fact of these murders. The domination by the party, however, makes the cabinet's characterization of these criminal acts by Hitler and his top party leaders as state measures consistent with political reality. I refer now to document 2057 PS, which is the English translation of the law relating to the National Emergency Defense Measures of 3rd of July, 1934, in the Reichs Gazette Blatt of that year, part one, page 529. And I quote the single article of that law, which reads as follows. That's document 2057. Quoting. This still has reference to do with the blood purge. The measures taken on the 30th of June and 1 and 2 July 1934 to counteract attempt at treason and high treason shall be considered as national emergency defense, unquote. On 12 July 1934, there was enacted a law defining the function of the Academy for German Law. I refer to document 1391 PS, which is an English translation of the statute of the Academy for German Law, 12 July 34, 1934, Reichs Gazette Blatt, part one, pages 605 and six. I don't think we caught what number you said. Yes, sir, 1391, I beg your pardon. <coughs> First paragraph, 1391. Yes. 
closely connected with the agencies competent for legislation, it, the Academy, shall further the realization of the National Socialist Program in the realm of the law, unquote. On 30 January 1933, Hitler, the leader of the Nazi Party and Führer of the Leadership Corps, was appointed Chancellor of the Reich. When President von Hindenburg died in 1934, the Führer amalgamated to his person the offices of Chancellor and Reich President. I refer to document 2003 PS, which establishes that fact, and I don't quote its uh, Reich's Gazette, Blatt, 1934, part one, page 747. By decree of the 20th of December, 1934, party uniforms and institutions were granted the same protection as those of the state. This law was entitled, quote, Law Concerning Treacherous Acts Against the State and Party and for the Protection of Party Uniforms. This law imposed heavy penalties upon any person making false statements, injuring the welfare or prestige of the Nazi party or its agencies. It authorized the imprisonment of persons making or circulating malicious or baiting statements against leading personalities of the Nazi party. And it provided punishment by forced labor, labor for the unauthorizing wearing of party uniforms or symbols. I again refer to document 1393, uh, not quoting, which is the English translation and give the authority. Finally, by the law of 15 September 1934, the swastika flag of the party was made the official flag of the Reich. I refer to document 2079, which is the English translation of the Reich flag law found in Reich Gazette, Blatt, 1935, Part one, page 1145. Just a one sentence quotation. The Reich and national flag is the swastika flag, unquote. The swastika was the flag and symbol of the leadership corps of the Nazi party. By law, it was made the flag of the state, a recognition that the party and its core of political leaders were the sovereign powers in Germany. On 23rd of April, 1936, a law was enacted granting amnesty for crimes which the offender had committed, quote, in his eagerness to fight for the national socialist ideal, unquote. I cite document 1386, which is the English translation of a law concerning amnesty, Reich's Gazette, Blatt, 1936, part one, page 378. In furtherance of the conspiracy to acquire totalitarian control over the German people, a law was enacted on 1 December 1936, which incorporated the entire German youth within the Hitler youth, thereby achieving total mobilization of the German youth. And I cite document 1392, containing that law, 1936 Gazette, Reich's Gazette Blatt, Part 1, page 993. The law further provided that the task of educating the German youth through the Hitler youth was entrusted to the Reichsleiter of the German youth in the NSDAP. By this law, a monopoly control over the entire German youth was placed in the hands of the top official, a Reichsleiter of the leadership corps of the Nazi party, the defendant von Schirach. On 4, 70, uh, 4 February 1938, the Führer of the Leadership Corps of the Nazi Party, Hitler, issued a decree in which he took over directly the command of the whole German armed forces. I cite document 1915 PS, 1939 Reich's Gazette Blatt, part one, page 111. Hitler says, from now on I take over directly the command of the whole armed forces, unquote. By virtue of the earlier law of 1 August 1934, Hitler combined the office of the Reich President and Chancellorship. In the final result, therefore, Hitler was the supreme commander of the armed forces, the head of the German state, and the Führer of the Nazi party. 
In respect to this, the party manual states as follows, and I quote from page 19 of document 1893 PS. Page 19, document 1893. The Fuhrer created the National Socialist German Workers' Party. He filled it with his spirit and his will, and with it he conquered the power of the state on 30 January 1933. The Fuhrer's will is supreme in the party. By authority of the law about the chief of state of the German Reich, dated 1 August 1934, the office of the Reich President is combined with that of the Reich Chancellor. Consequently, the powers heretofore possessed by the Reich President were transferred to the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. Through this law, the conduct of the party and state has been combined in one hand. <coughs> By desire of the Fuhrer, a plebiscite was conducted on this law on 19 August 1934. On this day, the German people chose Adolf Hitler to be their sole leader. He is responsible only to his conscience and the German nation, unquote. A decree of 16 January 1942 provided that the Pala Party should participate in legislation and official appointments and promotions. I cite as proof document 2100 PS which is the English translation of a directive concerning the application of the Fuhrer decree relating to the chief of the party chancellor. 1942 writes Gazette Black, part one, page 35. The decree further provided that such participation should be undertaken exclusively by the defendant Bormann, chief of the party chancellery, and Reich leader and Reich leader of the leadership court. The decree provided that the chief of the party chancellery was to take part in the preparation of all laws and decrees issued by Reich authorities, including those issued by the Ministerial Council for Defense of the Reich, and to give his assent to those of the lander and of the Reich governors, the lander being the German states. All communications between the state and party authorities, unless within the Gau only, were to pass through Bormann's hands. This decree is of crucial importance in demonstrating the ultimate control and responsibility imputable to the leadership corps or governmental policy <coughs> and actions taken in furtherance of the conspiracy. On about the 26th of April, 1942, Hitler declared in a speech that in his capacity as leader of the nation, supreme commander of the armed forces, supreme head of the government, and as Fuhrer of the party, his right must be recognized to compel with all means at his disposal every German, whether soldier, judge, state official, or party official, to fulfill his desire. He demanded that the Reichstag officially recognize this asserted right. And on the 26th of April, 42, the Reichstag issued a decision in which full recognition was given to the rights of the Fuhrer, which I have just asserted. I cite document 1961, PS, which is the English translation of that decision, Found in 1942, writes Gazette Blatt, Part 1, page 247. Document 1961. I quote, At the proposal of the President of the Reichstag on its session of 26 April 1942, the Greater Reichstag has approved of the rights which the Fuhrer has postulated in his speech with the following decision. There can be no doubt that in the present war, in which the German people are faced with a struggle for its existence or annihilation, the Fuhrer must have all the rights postulated by him which serve to further or achieve victory. Therefore, without being bound by existing legal regulations, in his capacity as leader of the nation, supreme commander of the armed forces, governmental chief, supreme executive chief, 
as supreme justice and as leader of the party, the Fuhrer must be in a position to force with all means at his disposal every German, if necessary, whether he be a common soldier or officer, low or high, official or judge, leading or subordinate official of the party, worker or employee, to fulfill his duties. In case of violation of these duties, the Fuhrer is entitled, after conscientious examination, regardless of so-called well-deserved rights, to meet out due punishment and to remove the offender from his post, rank, and position without introducing prescribed procedures. At the order of the Fuhrer, this decision is hereby made public. Berlin, 26 April 1942, end of quotation. Hitler himself perhaps best summarized the political realities of his Germany, which constituted the basis for the prosecution submission at the leadership corps of the Nazi party, and its following effectively dominated the state and government. The core and the crux of the matter was stated by Hitler in his speech to the Reichstag on 20th February 1938, when he declared in effect that every institution in Germany was under the direction of the leadership corps of the Nazi party. I cite as the prosecution's final exhibit in support of the proposition that the leadership corps dominated the German state with the resulting responsibility, document 2715 PS, which is the book containing Hitler's speech to the Reichstag on the 20th of February, 1938, as reported in Das Archiv, volume 47, February 1938, pages 1441 and 1442. I quote a brief excerpt from document 2715 as I have introduced. National socialism has given the German people that leadership which as party not only mobilizes the nation but also organizes it so that on the basis of the natural principle of selection, the continuance of a stable political leadership is safeguarded forever. National socialism possesses Germany entirely and completely since the day when five years ago I left the house in the Wilhelmsplatz as Reich Chancellor. There is no institution in this state which is not National Socialist. Above all, however, the National Socialist Party in these five years not only has made the nation National Socialist, but also has given itself that perfect organizational structure which guarantees its performance for all the future. The greatest guarantee of the National Socialist Revolution lies in the complete domination of the Reich and all of its institutions and organizations internally and externally by the National Socialist Party. Its protection against the world abroad, however, lies in the new National Socialist armed forces. In this Reich, Anybody who has a responsible position is a national socialist. Every institution of this Reich is under the orders of the supreme political leadership. The party leads the Reich politically. The armed forces defend it militarily. There is nobody in any responsible position in this state who doubts that I am the authorized leader of this Reich, unquote. The supreme power which the leadership corps exercised over the German state and government is pointed out by an article published in this same authoritative magazine, Der Hoheitsträger, in February 1939. In this article, which was addressed to all Hoheitsträger, 
The leadership corps is reminded that it has conquered the state and it possesses absolute and total power in Germany. I cite document 3230, P.S. which is the English translation of an article entitled, quote, Fight and Order, and I quote from this article, which trumpets forth and what we might term as accents of Caesarism, the battle call to the leadership core of the German life. I quote, the first word is fight. Question, why do you always talk of fighting? You have conquered the state, and if something does not please you, then just make a law and regulate it differently. Why must you always talk of fighting? For you have every power. Over what do you fight? Outer politically, you have the Wehrmacht. It will wage the fight. Fight is required. Inner politically, you have the law and the police, which can change everything which does not agree with you, unquote. In view of the domination of the German state and government, of the Nazi party and the leadership core thereof, established with the foregoing and other evidence heretofore recited in the previous trial briefs, it is submitted that the leadership corps of the Nazi party was responsible for the measures, including the legislative enactments taken by the German state and government in furtherance of the conspiracy formulated and carried out by the co-conspirators and the organizations charged with the criminality in the present case. I now skip until go to the overt acts and crimes of the leadership corps. The evidence now to be presented will establish that the membership of the leadership corps actively entered into a wide variety of acts and measures designed to advance the course of the conspiracy. The evidence will show that such participation by the leadership corps and the conspiracy embraces such measures as anti-Semitic activities, war crimes committed against members of the Allied forces, participation in the forced labor program, measures to subvert and undermine the Christian religion and persecute the Christian clergy, the plundering and spoliation of cultural and other property in German-occupied territories in Europe, participation in plans and measures leading to the initiation and prosecution of aggressive war, and in general, a wide variety of measures embracing the crimes against the peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, as defined and denounced to the charge. The first item of evidence we have to introduce is in connection with the participation of the Gauleiter and Chrysler in the, uh, what the Nazis describe as, quote, the spontaneous uprising of the people, unquote, against the Jews throughout Germany on 9th and 10th, November, 1938. We do not intend to introduce, diverting from the text, any evidence formally introduced by Major Walsh on the persecution of the Jews, but only to show the connection of a few of the party officials. In connection with the assassination of an official of the German embassy in Paris on the 7th of November, the evidence relating to these pogroms has been thoroughly presented in connection with the prosecution's evidence in other phases of the case, particularly the persecution of the Jews. I shall therefore limit myself to two documents and will request the tribunal to call that in, recall that in the teletype directive from SS Gruppenführer Heydrich 
issued the 10th of November, 1938, to all police headquarters and SD districts. All chiefs of the state police were ordered to contact the political leaders in the Gao and the Kreis and to arrange with these high officials in the leadership corps the organization of the so-called spontaneous demonstration against the Jews. The evidence previously presented showed that pursuant to this directive, a large number of the Jewish shops and businesses were pillaged and wrecked, synagogues set on fire, individual Jews beaten up, and large numbers were taken to the concentration camp. This evidence forcibly illustrates the employment and participation of all the Chrysleiter and Galiter in illegal and inhuman measures designed to further the anti-Semitic program and which was an original and continuous objective of the leadership core of the Nazi party. And I simply refer again to exhibit 3051, or rather 3051 PS, U.S. Exhibit 240, and simply call your honor's attention <coughs> to the different political leaders that were named in that document, and I will not attempt to read nor refer to it again. Diverting again from the text, I want to offer at this well, time but, uh, evidence. Colonel Story, yes, sir. is it addressed uh, to these various uh, ranks Let in the leadership the, corps? Uh, Your Honor, I notice on the first page it's addressed, I'm not good in German, but to the state police, to the SD, and to some other SD officials. So what, what, what's that got to do with the leadership call? It uh, has to do with uh, directions to party officials to take part in these demonstrations. In other words, through certain officials of the leadership corps, this directive was dispatched and directed. Well, this is the police. the state police and the SD aren't uh, any of these uh, ranks in the, in the right leadership? Your Honor will refer to this original chart, the big one. You will notice that the SA, the SS, and several of the organizations are listed on the left-hand part of that big chart. The big <coughs> one that's in the uh, folder there on the Your Honor's desk. In other words, a, a close examination of that uh, directive will uh, show that they were to contact different political leaders in connection with uh, carrying into effect this demonstration of the 9th and 10th of September. That is the only purpose for which it is offered. It's been introduced in evidence, but the reason I mention it at this time. Well, I, I can't see that it shows it. It seems to me to be a letter from the chief of the security police Do you have any to all headquarters and stations of the state police. I don't have the English translation before me at this moment, Your Honor. Well, go on. Um, I now offer in evidence document 3063, U.S. Exhibit 332. This was a report from the Chief Party Judge Book to the defendant Gary, dated the 13th of February, 1939, concerning action taken by the Supreme Party Court for excesses in connection with the demonstrations of 9 and 10 November, 1938. 
I don't believe this, Your Honor, please, is in the uh, document book, 3063. Yes, it yes, 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 is. Is it? Yes. I beg your pardon. I've forgotten what it is in here. And I quote just a brief portion of it. Quote, when all the synagogues burned down in one night, it must have been organized in some way and can only have been organized by the party. Unquote. That's the only, it's a long document, and that's the only portion I quote, and I don't have the reference to it. Hey. I'm sorry, sir, I don't have the reference to this. You can get it. It reads. Yes, it, it, on page one. Uh, but still, if you haven't got the document before you, it isn't much use referring you to it. I gave the German text over there, sir. Yeah. When all the synagogues burned down in one night, it must have been organized in some way and can only have been organized for the part. First paragraph, page seven. Now I turn to illustrative crimes against the Allied airmen. The members of the leadership corps of the Nazi party participated in and share the responsibility for the murder, beating, and ill treatment of Allied airmen who landed in German or German-controlled territory. Many Allied airmen who bailed out of disabled planes over Germany were not treated as prisoners of war, but were beaten and murdered by German civilians with the active condiments, indeed at the instigation of some of the leadership corps of the Nazi party. Such a course of conduct for the leadership corps represented a flagrant and deliberate violation by the German government of its obligations under the Geneva Convention to protect prisoners of war against acts of violence and ill treatment. As shown by document 2473, it's not necessary to turn to that, which is a list of the Reich Leiter of the Nazi party, appearing in the National Yearbook of 1943, and by document 2903, which is this large chart. Heinrich Himmler was a Reich Leiter of the Nazi party, and thus a top official in the leadership corps by virtue of his positions as Reichsführer of the SS and delegate for German folkdom. I now offer in evidence an original order signed by Himmler. Document number R1110. As USA exhibit number 333. Do you mean 110? R110. It's right at the last of the documents, if Your Honor, please. Yes. And that is an original signed by Himmler himself. And it's dated 10 August 1943, and I quote, It is not the task of the police to interfere in clashes between Germans and English and American terror flyers who have bailed out, unquote. This order was transmitted in writing to all senior executive SS and police officers and orally to their subordinate offices and to all gala. As shown in document 2473 and by the chart, Joseph Gebel, beg your pardon, well, I was only thinking that the police aren't, aren't part of the leadership corps, are they? But Himmler, if you honor, please, combined the offices himself of Reichsführer of the SS and the head of the German police. He was an officer of the state, he was an officer of the party, <coughs> and he issued this uh, to officials of the leadership corps. Then your thought would be that uh, this order of Himmler's could be uh, 
to be proof against the 600,000 members that you've spoken of? Not against the members, but I'd say against, against the, the organization as a criminal organization, because from the top, they disseminated orders of this type through the channels of the leadership corps. Yes, but uh, that is what I was putting to you, that it wasn't through the channels of the leadership corps, but it was through the channels of the police. But the police, if you honor please, were connected with the leadership corps, and Himmler stood at the top of both. It doesn't show on that chart, but it shows on the, the other big chart, if your honors please. Now next. With reference to Goebbels, who was a top flight official in the leadership corps, the Nazi party, by virtue of his position as propaganda leader of the party. In the issue of the Volkische Beobachter, 26, or 28th 9th of May, 1944, there appeared an article written by Goebbels, the Reichsleiter for Party Propaganda, in which he openly invited the German civil population to punish Allied flyers shot down over Germany. I refer to document 1676, which is the issue of the Volkische Beobachter containing this article, inciting the people to the commission of war crimes. I now quote, it is only possible with the aid of arms to secure the lives of enemy pilots who were shot down during such attack, for they would otherwise be killed <coughs> by the sorely tried population. Who is right here? The murderers who, after their cowardly misdeeds, await a humane treatment on the part of their victims, or the victims who wish to defend themselves according to the principle, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This question is not hard to answer. End of quotation. Reichleiter Goebbels then proceeds to answer his question in the following language and still quote it. It seems to us hardly possible and tolerable to use German police and soldiers against the German people when it treats murderers of children as they deserve, unquote. On the 30th of May, 1944, the defendant Bormann, Reichleiter and chief of the party chancellery, issued a circular letter on the subject which furnishes proof that British and American flyers who were shot down were lynched by the German population. I offer this circular letter of the defendant Bormann into evidence, document 057 PS. It's up towards the top. You got the original book. Document 057 PS. You got the original. You have the original. Just a moment, Your Honor. The After alleging that in recent weeks, English and American flyers had repeatedly shot children, women, peasants, and vehicles on the highway, Borman then states as follows in the second paragraph of the English translation. I quote, several instances have occurred where members of the crews of such aircraft who have bailed out or who have made forced landings were lynched on the spot immediately after capture by the populace, which was incumbent to the highest degree. No police measures or criminal proceedings were invoked against the German civilians who participated in these incidents." Unquote. The attention of the tribunal is particularly invited to the fact that this letter of the defendant Bormann is distributed 
through the chain of command of the Nazi party, expressly mentioning on the distribution list Reichleiter, Gauleiter, Kreisleiter, and leaders of the incorporated and affiliated organizations of the party. The defendant Bormann requested in the first paragraph of the second page, which is found in the English translation, that the lo local group leaders, Ortsgruppenleiter, be informed of the contents of his circular letter orally, only by oral means. The effect of Reichleiter Bormann's circular letter may be seen in an order dated 25 February 1945, which I now offer in evidence, and it's Exhibit L-154. U.S. Exhibit 325. It is an order from Albert Hoffman, an important member of the Leadership Corps, by virtue of his position as Gauleiter, a National Defense Commissioner of the Gau Westphalen South. Document L-154. It's up near the first. And it is addressed to all county councilors, mayors, police officials, and to county leaders and county chiefs of the Volkstorm. The order reads in part, and I quote, Fighter bomber pilots. Do you want to find it, the L-154? No, the L-154 is the wrong document. Go right here. I'll follow this. I'm sorry, there's some error in some of them. Fighter bomber pilots who are shot down are not to be protected against the fury of the people. I expect from all police officers that they will refuse to lend their protection to these gangster types. Authorities acting in contradistinction to the popular sentiment will have to account to me. All police and gendarmerie officials are to be inform informed immediately of this, my attitude." Unquote. The obligations of who, the belligerents who is toward... Who Pardon. is Hoffman? Albert Hoffman was a member of the Leadership Corps by virtue of his position as Gauleiter, a okay. National Defense Commissar of the Gal Westphalen South. <coughs> This connection, uh, Your Honor, please, I quote the provisions of the Geneva Convention, 27 July 1927, Article 2, which provides, and I simply ask the court to take judicial knowledge, prisoners of war are in the power of the hostile power, but not of the individuals or corps who have captured them. They must at all times be humanely treated and, protect, and protected, particularly against the acts of violence, insults, and public curiosity. Measures of reprisal against them are prohibited." Unquote. Is that the 1907? 1929 of uh, the Geneva Convention, dated 27 July 1929 and being Article 22. Article 2, I beg your pardon. And it was also ratified by Germany and the United States. <coughs> it is clear from the foregoing quoted portions that the Geneva Prisoner of War Convention imposes upon its signatories the strictest obligation to protect its prisoners of war from violence. The evidence just presented shows that the German state violated this provision. The evidence also proves that members of the leadership corps of the Nazi party participated in the conspiracy to incite the German civilian population to take part 
in these atrocities. Now I next turn to some illustrative crimes against foreign labor. On 13 September 1936, Reichleiter of the party organization, Dr. Robert Lai, addressed 20,000 people attending a session of the party congress. The official account of the party rally states that the Fuhrer was received with, quote, enthusiastic shouts of exultation when he strode through the hall with his deputies and his, his constant retinue and several Reichleiter or Gauleiter. I'm referring to document 2283PS. And it's the Volkischer Beobachter of 14 September, 1936, page 11, which we offer. In his speech, Reichleiter Robert Lai states that he had been mystified when the Fuhrer ordered him, quote, in middle April 1933 to take over the trade union since I could not see any connection between my task as organizational leader of the party and my new task. Lai continues by stating that very soon it became clear to him why his responsibility as Reichleiter of the party, organization and leader of the German labor front, made logical his selection by the Fuhrer as the man to direct the smashing and dissolution of the free trade union. And I quote from that document. What page is it? Quote, very soon your decision, my Fuhrer, became clear to me, and I recognized that the organizational measures of the party could only come to full fruition when supplemented by the organization of the people. That is to say, by the mobilization of the energies of the people and by their concentration and alignment. My task as Reichleiter of the party organization and as leader of the German Labor Front were a completely homogeneous task. In other words, in everything I did, I acted as Reichleiter of the party organization. The German Labor Front was an institution of the party and was led to it. The German Labor Front had to be organized regionally according to the same principles as the party. That is why trade union and employee associations had to be smashed unrelentingly and the basis of the construction was formed as in the party by the cell and the local section, unquote. On the 17th of October, 1944, Reichleiter Rosenberg sent a letter to Reichleiter Bormann, which I introduce as document 327PS, U.S. Exhibit 338. In which he informed the letter that he had sent a telegram to the Gauleiter urging them not to interfere in the liquidation of certain listed companies and banks under his supervision. <coughs> Rosenberg emphasizes to Bormann that any, quote, delay of liquidation or independent confiscation of the property by the Gauleiter would impair or destroy an organized plan, unquote, for the liquidation of the vast amount of property. On the 7th of November, 1943, the chief of the general staff of the armed forces delivered a lecture at Munich to the Reichleiter and the Gallag. <clears throat> I now refer <clears throat> to document L-172 previously introduced in evidence as US, USA Exhibit Number 34, <laughs> L-172. 
The Chief of Staff stated that his object was to give a review of the strategic position at the outset of the fifth year of the war. And he stated he realized that the political leaders in the Reich and Gao areas, in view of their burdensome task in supporting the German war effort, were in need of information he could give. He stated in part as follows, I quote, Weisleiter Bormann has requested me to give you a review today of the strategic position in the beginning of the fifth year of war. No one, the Fuhrer has ordered, may know more or be told more than he needs for his immediate task. But I have no doubt at all in my mind, gentlemen, but that you need a great deal in order to be able to cope with your task. It is in your gal, after all, that all the enemy propaganda and the malicious rumors concentrate that try to find themselves a place among our people. Against this wave of enemy propaganda and cowardice, you need to know the true situation. And for this reason, I believe that I am justified in giving you a perfectly open and uncovered account of the state of affairs." Unquote. Reichleiter Bormann distributed to all Reichleiter, Gauleiter, leaders of party-affiliated organizations, an undated letter, which is document 656PS, U.S. Exhibit 339. 656PS. <coughs> on the National Socialist Party Stationery, signed by Borman. An order of the, of the Supreme Command of the Wehrmacht relating to self-defense by German guard personnel and German contractors and workers against prisoners of war. The order of the Wehrmacht referred to states that the question of treatment of prisoners of war is continually being discussed by the Wehrmacht and party bureaus. The order states that should prisoners of war refuse to obey orders to work, the guards have, quote, in the case of the most pressing need and danger, the right to force obedience with the weapon if he has no other means. He can use the weapon as much as is necessary to attain his goal, unquote. On the 18th of April, 1944, Reich Commissar Lush, Reich Minister for the Occupied Eastern Territories, in a letter to Reich Youth Leader Oxman, and I now offer in evidence document 347 PS, U.S. Exhibit 340. Propose that the Hitler Youth participate in and supervise the military education of the Estonian and Latvian youth. Lush states in the above letter that in the military, quote, in the military education camps, the young Latvians are trained under Latvian leaders in the Latvian language, not because this is our ideal, but because absolute military necessity demands this. Loesch further stated in the above letter, and I quote, in contrast to the Germanic peoples of the West, military education is no longer to be carried out through voluntary enlistment, but through legal conscription camps in Estonia and Latvia will have to be under German leadership, and as military education camps of the Hitler Youth, they must be a symbol of our educational mission beyond Germany's borders. I consider the execution of the military education and of the Estonian and Latvian youth not only a military necessity, but also a war mission of the Hitler Youth especially. And I would be thankful to you, party member Oxman, 
if the Hitler Youth would put itself at our disposal with the same readiness with which they have so far supported our work in the Baltic area, unquote. An order of the Reich Minister of the Interior, Frick, dated 22 October 1938, which is document 1438 PS, of which I asked the court to take judicial notice, and I quote, the Reich Führer SS and the chief of the German police <coughs> can take the administrative measures necessary for the maintenance of security and order, even beyond the legal limits otherwise set on such measures." Unquote. The above order related to the administration of Sudeten German territory. In a letter dated 23rd June 1943, our document 407 PS, already in evidence as Exhibit 209, Galliter and Plenipotentiary for the Direction of Labor, Fritz Sockel, wrote to Hitler advising him of the success of the forced labor program as of that date and stating that, and I quote, quote, you can be assured that the district of Thur Thuringen, the Gau, and I will serve you and our dear people with the employment of all our strength, unquote. I now offer in evidence document 630 PS. 630? 630. P.S. Yes. <coughs> USA Exhibit 342. Your Honor, please, I'd like to call your attention that this is on the personal stationery of Adolf Hitler. It's dated 1 September 1939. It's addressed to Reichleiter Bowler and uh, Dr. Medicine Brandt, looks like, and it's signed personally by Adolf Hitler. And I want to quote all of that document, it's short. <coughs> Quoting, Reichleiter Bowler and Dr. Brandt, M.D., are charged with the responsibility of enlarging the authority of certain physicians to be designated by name in such a manner that persons who, according to human judgment, are incurable, can, upon a most careful diagnosis of their condition of sickness, be accorded a mercy death, signed Adolf Hitler. A handwritten note on the face of this document states, and I quote, given to me by Bowler on 27 August, 1940, signed Dr. Gertman. In a memorandum recording an agreement between himself and Himmler, the Minister of Justice, Thierack, stated that on the suggestion of Reichleiter Bormann, an agreement had been reached between Himmler and himself with respect to special treatment at the hands of the police in cases where judicial sentences were not severe enough. And I offer document 654 PS, U.S. Exhibit 218, which has been previously introduced. Oopsie. And I want to quote one portion. The Reich Minister for Justice will decide whether and when special treatment at the hands of the police is to be applied. The Reich Führer of the SS will send the reports 
which he sent hitherto to Reichleiter Bormann, to the Reich Minister of Justice, unquote. If the views of the Reich Führer of SS and Reich Minister for Justice disagreed, quote, the opinion of, the, of Reichleiter Bormann will be brought to bear on the case and he will possibly inform the Führer. In the above note, it is further stated, quote, the delivery of antisocial elements from execution of their sentence to the Reichsführer SS to be worked to death, persons under protective arrest, Jews, gypsies, Russians, and Ukrainians, Poles with more than three-year sentences, Czechs and Germans with more than eight-year sentences, according to the decision of the Reich Minister of Justice. First of all, the worst antisocial elements amongst those just mentioned are to be handed over. I shall inform the Fuhrer of this through Reichleiter Bormann. With respect to the administration of justice by the people, he continues, this is to be carried out step by step as soon as possible. I shall rouse the party particularly to cooperate in this scheme by an article in the Hoheitsträger, unquote, and your honors have already seen copies of that publication. I now skip paragraph 16 and 17. A letter from the RSHA, which is the Reich Security Main Office, to the Polish chiefs, dated the 5th of November, 1942, which is document uh, L316, L316, U.S. Exhibit 346, This was addressed to all police chiefs, dated the 5th of November, 1942, recites an agreement between the Reich Bureau SS and the Reich Minister of Justice and approved by Hitler. I call the attention of your honor to the red border around this original and then having the party seal on it. <coughs> provides that the ordinary criminal procedure was no longer to be applied to Poles and members of the Eastern population. The agreement providing that such people, including Jews and gypsies, should henceforth be turned over to the police. The principles applicable to a determination of the punishment of German offenders, including appraisal of the motives of the offender, were not to be applied to foreign offenders. And I quote, from the document, page two of the document. Number of it. L316. <coughs> yes. The offense committed by a person of foreign extraction is not to be regarded from the view of legal retribution by way of justice, but from the point of view of preventing dangers through police action. From this it follows that the criminal procedure against persons of foreign extraction must be transferred from justice to the police. The preceding statements serve for personal information. There are no objections if the Galliter are informed in the usual form should the need arise, unquote. I now skip paragraphs 19 and 20 of the text. Next, refer to document 1058 PS previously introduced in evidence as USA Exhibit 147. 1058 PS. 
In a speech to a gathering of persons intimately concerned with the Eastern problem on the 20th of June, 1941, Reichleiter Rosenberg stated that the southern Russian territories and the northern Caucasus would have to provide food for the German people. I quote Rosenberg's words, quote, we see absolutely no obligation on our part to feed also the Russian people with the products of that surplus territory. We know that this is a harsh necessity, bare of any feelings, unquote. Well, we've already had that read to us twice, I think. I'm sorry, sir, Your Honor, I didn't hear it. Strike it from the record, then. <coughs> I now refer to document R114. I believe it's the last one in the book. Exhibit, U.S. Exhibit 314. Gauleiter Wagner of the German occupied areas of Alsace prepared plans and took measures leading to the expulsion and deportation of certain groups within the Alsatian civil population. His plans called for the forcible expulsion of certain categories of so-called undesirable persons as a means of punishment and compulsory Germanization. The Gauleiter supervised deportation measures in Alsace from July to December 1940 in the course of which 105,000 persons were either expelled or prevented from returning. A memorandum dated 4 August 1942 of a meeting of high SS and police officials convened to receive the reports and plans of the Gauleiter relating to the Alsatian evacuations states that the persons deported were mainly, quote, Jews, gypsies, and other foreign racial elements criminals, social, uh, social and incurably insane persons, as well as Frenchmen and Francophiles. The memorandum further states the Gauleiter stated that the Fuhrer had given him permission, quote, to cleanse Alsace of all foreign, sick, or unreliable elements, and that the Gauleiter emphasized the political necessity of further deportation. The memorandum further records that the SS and police officials present at the conference approved the Gauleiter's proposals for further evacuation. I now skip over the next to paragraph 24. A memorandum of Reichleiter Bormann of a conference called at Hitler's headquarters on July 16, 1941, which is document L-221, USA Exhibit 317. I'm sorry, I believe that one was quoted this morning. The only purpose in referring to it is connection with the rice lighter. I believe Mr. Harris quoted from that document this morning, and I'll not read the quotation. <coughs> Call attention, however, that it was attended this conference by rice lighter Rosenberg, Reich Minister Lammers, Field Marshal Keitel, Reich Marshal, the Reich Marshal, and Bormann, and lasted about 20 hours. The memorandum states that discussion occurred with respect to the annexation by Germany of various parts of conquered Europe. The memorandum also states that a long discussion took place with respect to the qualifications of Gauleiter Lush who was proposed by Rosenberg at the conference as governor of the Baltic country. Discussion also occurred, according to the memo, with respect to the qualifications of other Gauleiter 
and commissioners for the administration of various areas of occupied Russia. Goering stated, according to the memorandum, that he intended to appoint Galliter to Bolton for, quote, exploitation of the Kola Peninsula and the Fuhrer Greens, unquote. I believe the next portion has been quoted too. I now pass to the participation of the leadership corps in the subversion of the Christian church and the persecution of the clergy and cite some illustrative crimes. The evidence relating to the systematic effort of the defendants and co-conspirators to eliminate the Christian churches in Germany has been previously introduced in USA Exhibit Book H by Major Wallace with respect to the Nazi efforts to eliminate the Christian church. The evidence now to be presented is limited, proving and pointing up the responsibility of the leadership core of the Nazi party and the members thereof for illegal activities against the Christian church and clergy. Defendant Bormann issued a secret decree to all Gauleiter entitled Relationship of National Socialism and Christianity, and that's document D-75. <coughs> up towards the top, I believe, Your Honor. Exhibit, USA Exhibit 348. In this decree, Reichsleiter Bormann flatly declares that National Socialism and Christianity are incompatible and that the influence of the churches in Germany must be eliminated. I quote from pertinent portions of this decree beginning with the first paragraph thereof, top of page three, which reads as follows. National socialist and Christian concepts are irreconcilable. Our national socialist ideology is far loftier than the concepts of Christianity which in their essential points have been taken over from Jewry. For this reason also, we do not need Christianity. If therefore in the future our youth learns nothing more of this Christianity, whose doctrines are far below ours, Christianity will disappear by itself. It follows from the irreconcilability. Your Honor, please, it's the third page of the English translation. I read your part. Mm -hmm. It follows from the irreconcilability of National Socialist and Christian concepts that a strengthening of the existing confessions and every demand of originating Christian confessions is to be rejected by us. A differentiation between the various Christian confessions is not to be made here. For this reason also, the thought of an erection of an evangelical national church by merger of the various evangelical churches has been definitely given up because the evangelical church is just as inimical to us as the Catholic church. Any strengthening of the evangelical church would merely react against us. For the first time in German history, the Fuhrer consciously and completely has the leadership of the people in his own hand. With the party, its components, and attached units, the Fuhrer has created for himself, and thereby the German Reich leadership, an instrument which makes him independent of the church. All influences which might impair or damage the leadership of the people exercised by the Fuhrer <coughs> with the help of the NSDAP must be eliminated. More and more the people must be separated from the churches and their organs, the pastors. Of course the churches must and will, seen from their viewpoint, defend themselves against this loss of power. But never again must an influence on leadership of the people be yielded to the churches. This influence must be broken completely 
and finally, only the Reich government and by its direction to the party, its components and attached units have a right of leadership of the people. Just as the deleterious influences of astrologers, seers, and other fakers are eliminated and suppressed by the state, so must the possibility of the church influence also be totally removed. Not until this has happened does the state leadership have influence on the individual citizens. Not until then are people and the Reich secure in their existence for all the future. Uncool. I next offer an evidence document 070 PS toward the beginning. U.S. Exhibit 349, which is a copy of a letter issued from Borman's office dated 25 April 1941. to the defendant Rosenberg in his capacity as the Fuhrer's representative for the supervision of the entire mental and ideological training and education of the NSDAP. In this letter, Borman's office states that the measures have been taken leading to the progressive cancellation of morning prayers and other religious services and their substitution by Nazi mottos and slogans. I quote from the first paragraph of the document, 070 PS, quote, We are inducing schools more and more to reduce and abolish religious morning services. Similarly, the confessional and general prayers in several parts of the Reich have already been replaced by national socialistic mottos. I would be grateful to know your opinion on a future national socialist morning service instead of the present confessional morning services which are usually conducted once per week." Unquote. In a letter from Reichsleiter Bormann to Reichsleiter Rosenberg, dated 22 February 1940, document 098-PS, U.S. Exhibit 350, which I offer in evidence, Bormann declares to Rosenberg that the Christian religion and national socialism are incompatible. Foreman cites as examples of hostile. Yes. Would you uh, take care to give us the number of the document before you begin referring to it? I beg your pardon. Uh, this is 098 PS, isn't it? Document 098 PS. U.S. Oh, exhibit. The one before you referred to was 070 PS. Yes, 070. And before that, D75. That's correct. Sir. Yes. The honor's permission, rather than to quote the whole document, I have summarized it here as soon as possible. And one quotation from the fifth paragraph on the first page of that translation, I would like to quote fifth paragraph of the first page quoting Christianity and National Socialism <coughs> are phenomena which originated from entirely different basic causes. Both differ fundamentally so strongly that it will not be possible to construct a Christian teaching which would be completely <coughs> compatible with the point of view of the National Socialist ideology. Just as the communications of Christian faith would never be able to stand by the ideology of National Socialism in its entirety." Unquote. And then I quote from the last paragraph on page five of that document. Quote, 
the Fuhrer's deputy finds it necessary that all these questions should be thoroughly discussed in the near future in the presence of the Reich leaders, the Reichleiters, who are especially affected by them, end of the quotation. I next offer in evidence document 107 PS. Well, do you suggest that uh, the block lighters would uh, have to be present for that discussion? Your Honor, if in connection with the policy directives, uh, the pure principle goes from the top to the bottom. And if that policy is adopted, they may by directive send it as far as the block lighter. <coughs> he says to discuss it, <coughs> pardon me, in connection with the Reich lighter, who are the party directors. And I assume that if the party directors establish it as a policy, then they would issue appropriate directives to the other subordinate <coughs> members. Mr. Lambert has suggested also that it wouldn't be possible to discuss this matter with all the leadership corps, and therefore they discussed it with the party directors. Does that show they did discuss it with the directors? No, sir, that doesn't, doesn't follow. But it shows that it was a subject of discussion for the board of directors of the Nazi party. Yes, but the question is, who are the directors? Uh, five or six of them uh, sit here, the total of 16. Total of 16. Yes, but I thought that you were asking us to declare uh, the whole of the organization down to the block lighters as criminal. That's true, Your Honor, but this is one evidence, one evidence, one instance of the criminality of the organization, and we can't prove at each stage that all of them knew about it. We are trying to select different offenses and different crimes that were committed within the party. <coughs> Document 107 PS, which is USA Exhibit 351. We now offer in evidence which is a circular letter dated 17 June 1938 addressed by the defendant Bormann as Reichleiter and deputy of the Fuhrer to all Reichleiter and Galleiter. Bormann's letter encloses a copy of rules prepared by Reichleiter Hurl setting forth certain restrictive regulations with respect to participation of the Reich Labor Service in religious celebrations. I quote pertinent portions of the directions <coughs> issued by the Reichleiter Hurl, beginning with the first paragraph in the list of directions in document 107 PS on page one of the English translation. Quote, the Reich Labor Service is a training school in which the German youth should be educated to national unity in the spirit of national socialism. What religious beliefs a person has is not a decisive factor, but it is decisive when he first of all feels himself a German. Every religious practice is forbidden in the Reich Labor Service because it disturbs the comrade-like harmony of all working men and women. On this basis, every participation of the Reich Labor Service in churchly, that is, religious arrangements and celebrations is not possible. End of the quotation. The tribunal will appreciate that the position of the defendant <coughs> Bormann as deputy of the Fuhrer, the leadership corps of the Nazi party and chief of the Nazi party chancellery, 
and the position of Defendant Rosenberg is the Fuhrer's representative for the whole spiritual and philosophical education of the Nazi party. Give to the views for the whole spiritual and philosophical education of the Nazi party, give to the views of these defendants on religion and religious policy the highest official backing. <clears throat> the anti-Christian is an incomplete sentence here. The utterances and policies of these two defendants reveal a community of mind and intention amongst the most powerful leaders of the party, which was amply confirmed, and the evidence will show, for the actual treatment of the churches since 1933 throughout the course of the conspiracy. I now offer in evidence document 2349, U.S. Exhibit 352. which is an excerpt from the book, quote, The Myth of the 20th Century, unquote, written by the defendant Rosenberg. Did you say 2349? 2349. Doesn't seem to be in my book. Your Honor, sometimes a tab gets pulled off. If you turn to the one next to it, you might find it. Maybe. I quote from that document, quote, the idea of honor, national honor, is for us the beginning and end of our entire thinking and doing. It does not admit of any equal valued center of force alongside of it, no matter of what kind, neither Christian love, nor the free Masonic humanity, nor the Roman philosophy. End of the quotation. I now offer in evidence document 848 PS, U.S. Exhibit 353, which is a Gestapo telegram dated 24 July 1938. Dispatched from Berlin to Nuremberg, dealing with demonstrations and acts of violence against Bishop Sproul in Rodenburg. The Gestapo office in Berlin wired its Nuremberg office, a teletype account received from its Stuttgart office of disorderly conduct and vandalism <coughs> carried out by Nazi party members against Bishop Sproul. I quote from the fourth paragraph of page one of the English translation, document 848 PS, which reads as follows. Quote, the party on 23rd July, 1939, from 2100 on, carried out the third demonstration against Bishop Sproul. Participants, about 2,500 to 3,000, were brought from outside by bus, etc. The Rotenberg populace, again, did not participate in the demonstration. This town took rather hostile attitude toward the demonstration. The action got completely out of hand of the party member responsible for it. The demonstration stormed the palace, beat in the gates and doors. About 150 to 200 people forced their way into the palace, searched through the rooms, threw files out of the windows and rummaged through the beds in the rooms of the palace. One bed was ignited. The bishop was with Archbishop Gruber of Freiburg and the ladies and gentlemen of his menage in the chapel at Paris. A 
about 25 to 30 people pressed into this chapel and molested those present. Bishop Grober was taken for Bishop Sproul. He was grabbed by the robe and dragged back and forth in the floor. The Gestapo official in Stuttgart added that Bishop Grober desired, quote, to turn to the Führer and Reich Minister of the Interior, Dr. Frick, anew, unquote. And the Gestapo official added that he had found a full report of the demonstration after, quote, suppressing counter mass meetings, unquote. On the 23rd of July, 1938, the Reich Minister for Church Affairs, Curl, sent a letter to the Minister of State and Chief of Presidium Chancellery Berlin, stating that Bishop Sproul had angered the population by abstaining from the plebiscite of 10 April. I now offer in evidence document 849 PS, U.S. Exhibit 354. In this letter, Curl stated that the Gallagher, 849, yes. In this letter, Curl stated that the Gallagher and Governor of Württemberg had decided that in the interest of preserving the state's authority and in the interest of quiet and order, Bishop Sproul could no longer remain in office. I quote from the third paragraph of the first page, document 849 PS. The Reich governor had explained to the ecclesiastical board that he would no longer regard Bishop Sproul as head of the diocese of Rotenburg on account of his refraining from the election in the office that he desired Bishop Sproul to leave the Gal area because he could assume no guarantee for his personal safety. <coughs> that in the case of the return of the Bishop of Rotenburg, <coughs> he would see to it that all personal and official intercourse with him on the part of the state offices, as well as the party offices and the armed forces would be denied." Unquote. Carl further states in the above letter that his deputy had moved the foreign office through the German embassy at the Vatican to urge the Holy See to persuade Bishop Sproul to resign his bishop. Carl concludes by stating that should the effort to procure the bishop's resignation prove unsuccessful, and I quote it, it's on the second page near the end of the document, quote, the bishop would have to be exiled from the land or there would have to be a complete boycott of the bishop by the authorities, unquote. Where is that you're reading now? <laughs> Second page near the end. Second page of the English translation. About six lines from the bottom starts the bishop would have to be exiled. Right. On the 14th of July, 1939, Defendant Borman, in his capacity as deputy of the Fuhrer, issued a party regulation which provided that party members entering the clergy or undertaking the study of theology would have to leave the party. I now offer in evidence document 840, 840 PS, U.S. Exhibit 355. And this is a copy of a regulation of Borman relating to the admission of the clergy and students of theology into the party. I quote from the last paragraph of the English translation, which reads, I quote, I decree that in the future party members who enter the clergy or who turn to the study of theology have to leave the party, unquote. In this directive, Borman also refers to an earlier decree dated 9 February 1939, 
in which he had ruled that the admission of members of the clergy into the party was to be avoided. In this decree also, Borman refers with approval to a regulation of the Reich treasurer of the party, dated 10 May 1939, providing that, quote, clergymen as well as other fellow Germans who are also closely connected with the church cannot be admitted into the party, unquote. I now offer in evidence document 3268 ES 3268 U.S. Exhibit 356 which contain excerpts from the allocution of His Holiness Pope Pius XII to the Sacred College of June 2nd, 1945. In this address, His Holiness, after declaring that he had acquired an appreciation <coughs> of the great qualities of the German people in the course of 12 years of residence in their midst, expressed the hope that Germany could rise to its new dignity and a new life once it had laid the satanic, the satanic specter raised by National Socialism and the guilty have expatiated the crimes they have committed. After referring to repeated, repeated violations by the German government of the Concordat concluded in 1933, His Holiness declared, and I quote from the last paragraph of page one, the English translation, document 3268. The struggle against the church did in fact become ever more bitter. There was the dissolution of Catholic organizations, the gradual suppression of the flourishing Catholic schools, both public and private, the enforced weaning of the youth from family and church, the pressure brought to bear on the conscience of citizens and especially civil servants, the systematic defamation by means of the clever, <coughs> closely organized propaganda of the church, the clergy, the faithful, the church's institutions, teachings, and history, the closing dissolution and <coughs> confiscation of religious <coughs> houses and other ecclesiastical institutions, the complete suppression of the Catholic press and publishing houses. In the meantime, the Holy See itself multiplied its representations and protests to governing authorities in Germany, reminding them in clear and energetic language of their duty to respect and fulfill the obligations of the natural law itself that were confirmed by the Concordat. In these critical years, joining the alert vigilance of a pastor to the long-suffering patience of a father, our great predecessor, Pius XI, fulfilled his mission as supreme pontiff with intrepid courage. But when, after he had tried all means of persuasion in vain, he saw himself clearly faced with deliberate violations of a solemn pact, with a religious persecution masked or open, but always rigorously organized, his proclamation to the world on Passion Sunday, 1937, in his encyclical Sorge, what National Socialism really was, the arrogant apostasy from Jesus Christ, the denial of his doctrine and of his work of redemption, the cult of violence, the idolatry of race and blood, the overthrow of human liberty and dignity. From the presence, concentration camps and fortresses are now pouring out, together with the political prisoners, also the crowds of those, whether clergy or laymen, whose only crime was their fidelity to Christ <coughs> and to the faith of their fathers or the dauntless fulfillment of their duties as priests. In the forefront, the number and harshness of the treatment meted out to them were the Polish priests, from 1940 to 1945, 2,800 Polish ecclesiastics <coughs> and religious were imprisoned in that camp. Among them was the auxiliary bishop of 
I can't pronounce Polish name, <coughs> who died there of typhus. In April last, there were left only 816, all the others being dead, except for two or three transferred to another <coughs> camp. In the summer of 1942, 480 German-speaking ministers of religion were known to be gathered there. Of these, 45 were Protestants, all the others Catholic priests. In spite of the continuous inflow of new internees, especially from some dioceses, from the dioceses of Bavaria, Westphalia, their number is a result of the high rate of mortality at the beginning of this year did not surpass 350. Nor should we pass over in silence those belonging to occupied countries, Holland, Belgium, France, among whom the Bishop of Clermont, Luxembourg, Slo Slovenia, Italy. Many of th those priests and laymen endured indescribable sufferings for their faith and for their vocation. In one case, the hatred of the impious against Christ reached the point of parodying on the person of interned priests with barbed wire, discouraging, and crowning with thorns of our Redeemer. Unquote. I am ready for another document. I now offer in the evidence document. Well, I think perhaps it will be time now to adjourn. Yes. Sir.